Hello scholars! Today's lecture covers the era of progressivism. We are going to begin with an imperfect definition. Imperfect because historians themselves love to argue about what really qualifies as progressive and what the concepts and ideologies were that tied disparate peoples together into this loose movement. So what is progressivism? Well, our working definition will be the following. Progressivism is a range of social and political reforms at a local, then state, then national level. Their aim is to solve the problems of urban life, the power of corporations, and to push for more direct democracy. They wish to change people, end class conflict, control big business. It will lead to an enormous expansion of the federal government. At its heart, progressivism was a response to the problems of industrialization and urbanization. The beginning of progressive ideology, uh, especially in regards to urban reform, begins with the social gospel. This was the belief that part of being a Christian was not just focusing on your own beliefs, but also taking care of others in a social setting. Strains of progressivism will include a fear of monopolies, a belief in the interconnectedness of society, and an emphasis on science, efficiency, and expertise. Monopolies are an example of the fear that Americans have always had of concentrated power. We can see this if we think back to the American Revolution with the British Crown. But now it took the form of the corporation. Progressives will seek to rein in what appears to be an abuse of power by these companies. They are largely not opposed to capitalism. They simply want these companies to play by the rules. The interconnectedness of society is seen in the response to urban crime, poverty, and immigration. The notion of using science and efficiency comes with innovations like Taylorism, in which science is used specifically in factories. Progressives will apply the same sort of principle to social problems. Socialism will be on the rise during this time, especially with the candidacy, four times he will run, of Eugene Debs, and he will receive over one million votes in the election of 1912 but it will never be mainstream answer to the problem society and government faces. The progressive era is generally seen as stretching from 1890 to 1920. There is some overlap with the Gilded Age. Historians usually cite the Gilded Age as being from the 1870s to 1900s. But again, this is an example of historians trying to make sense of a complex set of reforms and movements. Two examples of pre-progressive legislation that are in keeping with progressive era reforms would be the Pendleton Civil Service Act. This was passed after the assassination of James Garfield, who was shot by a would-be office seeker, Charles Godot. This act sought to reform civil service. So, instead of people gaining office through patronage, which was to give favors uh, to somebody in office simply because they were an acquaintance, you can kind of think of this as a comparison to the spoil system that was instituted by Andrew Jackson. So instead of people gaining favors through that, they would now have to take civil service exams. Hopefully then, people that were most qualified, not just with the best connections, would find themselves in government bureaucracy. A second progressive piece of legislation was the Sherman Antitrust Act. This act would set the stage for later legislation that would more tightly enforce anti-monopoly government oversight. The first area that reformers sought to address was the city. Cities at this time were changing into something that we are more familiar with today, but problems had arisen that were not yet addressed. Reformers saw overcrowding, poor sanitation, and other blights as needing to be addressed. Garbage was rarely collected, people were more sickly, and tenements were overcrowded, especially with newly arrived immigrants. Furthermore, reformers saw alcoholism and saloons as dens of sin and corruption that needed to be addressed. With such overcrowded homes, it was logical that many husbands would wish to spend their evenings, and thus money, at the saloon rather than with their family and their tenement. The problems of immigration and poverty are also going to bring about the beginning of the rise of the inner city. Poor and newly arrived immigrants would migrate to the center of town, and those with more money would migrate outwards towards the suburbs. Today we're familiar with this sort of demographic shift and it comes out of this time period as well. Prior to reform, one of the ways that these problems were addressed was through the boss system. 
The boss system arises because, in truth, local and state governments aren't really equipped to handle the problems of immigration, poverty, unemployment, cleanliness, etc. that urbanization presents. Bosses in political machines, the most famous of which was Tammany Hall in New York, would fill this niche and were kind of a pseudo-governmental organization. They were a form of welfare before welfare existed. If a widow was in need, they may provide food and groceries. If a family lost their house due to a fire, they may help them find a new one. Many had representatives waiting on the docks to intercept and greet new immigrants, ready to give them employment. All of these came at a cost, of course, as immigrants were forced and eager to vote for those who were aiding them. The boss system was terribly corrupt, though. First, machines would sometimes transport en masse immigrants to the voting booths in order to ensure they voted properly. Also, they would utilize cemeteries and burial records to have constituents vote under multiple names, especially of those who were dead. Unlike today, when we have protections against this sort of fraud, it was much easier to accomplish. Boss Tweed's corruption was renowned, one of the best examples being a city courthouse budgeted at $250,000 that ended up costing $13 million. Securing the contract, Tweed would hire fake employees, who of course needed a salary, and inflate the cost of supplies in order to make the city have to pay more money for the project. As the cost of the project went up, Tweed would pocket the majority. In this in instance, 60% of the $13 million went directly into his pocket. So there are definitely pros and cons to this sort of system, but progressive reformers saw it as an overwhelmingly bad thing. They felt that immigrants were being taken advantage of and that it was necessary to increase the power of the government to address these problems. They also instigated settlement houses, Jane Addams Hull House in Chicago being the first. These settlement houses helped immigrants assimilate by teaching them English, providing food and shelter, educating them on American culture and the beliefs and values quote-unquote, of American middle class. This movement was also guided by a general belief, seen across other strands of progressivism, that environment influences an individual's development. Thus, if you could improve the environment, you could improve the person. Also worth noting is the fact that these houses were primarily run by women, often college-educated, and this would spawn the profession of social work. Local-level progressive reform is exemplified by Hazen Pingree, who is the mayor of Detroit. He combated corruption in the city by fighting for the general welfare of the people. When he discovered the citizens were being charged unfairly for their power and trolley rates, he did this by performing studies and using data collection, an example of the progressive impulse to use science. He then created new, publicly-run companies that could compete with the monopolistic power and trolley companies. These companies were taking advantage of the citizens, and in order to curb their power, he circumvented it by making an entirely new system. People loved this, of course, both for the new rates, which were much more affordable, and for the fighting of monopolistic power that it represented. At the state level, one of the most famous progressives was Robert La Follette, governor of Wisconsin. La Follette set up a railroad commission to investigate railroad firms and instituted reforms for direct democracy, such as the referendum. This puts the actions of legislatures directly to the people. The recall, which gives voters the right to remove elected officials. The initiative, which allows for submitting legislation directly to voters. And the direct primary, which allowed people, instead of party bosses, to choose candidates. Previously, candidates were chosen by these party bosses. The voter had one choice for who was on the ticket. For instance, if today's voters in various states did not hold primaries, then the Republican Party and the Democratic Party would choose the candidate before the presidential election was held. There would be no debates between candidates of the same party, such as Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, Democrats, or Ted Cruz and Donald Crump, Trump, Republicans. Instead, the party would choose one of them and then the people would vote. Direct democracy allows for the people to be more involved in the democratic process and thus limit corruption. This time we also see the secret Australian ballot in which your voting was done privately and you could split your ticket. So you could vote for a Democrat for a local judge and then a Republican for mayor. As these local and state changes occur, progressivism will go national, and by the time of the 1912 election, Theodore Roosevelt himself is even calling on a federal level for eight-hour workdays. 
There are several reasons for this, but one is the rise of muckraking. The term itself is coined by Roosevelt for those new brand of reporters who call themselves investigative journalists. There's a litany of various muckrakers, but a few of the most important are Ida Tarbell, Upton Sinclair, and Jacob Rees. Ida Tarbell was raised in oil fields and learns the industry from the ground up. She was hired by McClure's Magazine to write an expose on Standard Oil. She conducted extensive research, and over a five-year period, she writes 13 articles that together are known as A History of Standard Oil. She essentially argues that Standard Oil wasn't playing fair. She didn't criticize capitalism itself, just business practices. They intimidated and bullied competition and controlled, under Nelson Rockefeller, 90% of the oil market. This will lead to the breakup of Standard Oil into 30 different companies. Through vertical and horizontal integration, Standard Oil had become a monopoly. This breaking up of the trust will lead to the Clayton Antitrust Act of 1914, a piece of progressive era legislation that seeks to regulate big business. There were good trusts and bad trusts, and you should seek to protect against the bad trusts. A second, a second significant muckraker is Upton Sinclair, who will write a novel called The Jungle. This novel provided genuine insight in the practices of the meatpacking industry and the terribly poor hygienic standards they were abiding by. It will lead to the Meat Inspection Act of 1806, as well as the Food and Drug Act. The Pure Food and Drug Act was important because it aimed to make sure that patented products, especially those aimed at the health of their consumers, had fair packaging and labels. At the time, vaguely described medicines would frequently be nothing more than alcohol, and the label itself would be described as a tonic to cure most any malady. Along with simply being alcohol, they might even have ingredients such as axle grease that were not advertised, for obvious reasons. The Pure Food and Drug Act made it so that people knew what they were actually consuming and what was inside the product. For Sinclair's part, he said, I aimed for their hearts and hit them in the stomach. Jacob Reese worked as a muckraker journalist to show the terrible conditions of those living in tenements. His book, How the Other Half Lives, used flash photography and shock value. Reese and his team sought to uplift those in poverty and would actually kick in doors and surprise those living in squalor, taking their photo and aiming to give the reader a glimpse into how they lived. The Progressive Era is also responsible for women's suffrage. The early Seneca Falls Convention had stressed the need for women to have equal natural rights with men, a la John Locke. The new organizations, though, such as NASA, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, would make safer arguments. They argued that women voting would bring about benefits to society that were needed. Women could bring their virtues to politics and even possibly soothe male aggression. Wyoming had given women the right to vote in 1869, but the 1910 extension of the vote to women in Washington helped inspire a new era of state-level reform. The 19th Amendment, passed in 1920, gave women the right to vote. Theodore Roosevelt plays a big role in the progressive movement. He is a reform governor of New York who feels that capitalism is fine, you simply need to keep an eye on it. He promotes the square deal, in which government will help adjudicate problems between companies and unions. Unlike in the past, where the government would simply side with big business, the best example of this square deal is the anthracite coal strike. He actually invites the union representatives and businesses, and he works to broker a deal and find a solution. The union gets a 10% raise, the company isn't forced to officially recognize the union. Unrelated to his progressive policies, but in keeping with his tremendously active presidency, Roosevelt also helped to broker a peace accord between Japan and Russia at the conclusion of the Russo-Japanese War. This act would win him the Nobel Peace Prize. Roosevelt is a Republican, but after choosing not to run in the 1908 election, will then return in 1912 as a progressive. He won't be able to claim the Republican nomination. William Howard Taft will be the incumbent, and he will be given it. So he'll be the part of the new progressive party, or the Bull Moose Party, so named because he said he was strong as a bull moose. Roosevelt also matters during this time period because of his broad expansion of executive power. He felt that he could do anything necessary for the common good, so long as it wasn't explicitly forbade or illegal. He would use his bully pulpit to go public over legislators' heads by using media to his advantage. Today, any president who circumvents or goes around Congress to rally support for his legislative agenda, say by tweeting, holding press conferences, or being interviewed, is using a modern ver version of the bully pulpit. 
All right, friends, well, that about sums up the Progressive Era, so be sure to go back, highlight that vocabulary, write your summary, and I will see you soon. Goodbye!